It's not something to explain. It's something to be experienced. What you're seeing is a symbol of new life. Jesus Revolution is a true life story about Greg Laurie and Chuck Smith, who are two mega pastors and the origin story of how their churches and their ministry kind of came to existence. I wanted to do something that meant something, something of value. And then this script was delivered to me the next day. And I thought, here we go. I very much connected to the message of hope that the film brings, I think, so beautifully to people. Inspirational true stories are just the stories that we love to tell. And there's power in the idea that this really happened. We really fight to become better filmmakers every time we go out and we wanted to have really good production value and it was just a wonderful team effort that got that film across the finish line. It's a joyful, peaceful place to work, really, even when the days are long. The cast, they're just insane, they're stellar, super talented people, everybody's just been so fantastic to work with. I think the production value in this film is incredible. The history, the music, the storytelling is wonderful. Greatest crew experience and greatest cast experience I've ever had in my career. I think we made something really special out there on this one. Cameras, Amber. Greg! Greg? What are you doing here? We're here to save you, man, come on! I became friends with John Irwin years ago. And he said, you know, I've always wanted to make a movie out of this story. And he had that Time magazine with Jesus on the cover. Seems the movement's everywhere. All right, here we go. Jesus Revolution has been a film that I've wanted to make for a very long time. Over the course of making films like American Underdog or I Still Believe or even I Can Only Imagine, it's been this project that I've just been wanting to do. I just believe in it. At Kingdom Story Company, myself, John Irwin, Andy Irwin, we have this slate of films that we kind of dream of putting together, and, and Jesus Revolution was one of those. Oh my gosh, you might actually shoot this movie. It really was John's baby. Uh, most of our films I can take credit for, but this one, John definitely deserves the credit. These are the headlines of our time. Think about 1967 first cover story of time with no picture, just a black, bleak background with the words, is God dead? Four years later, Jesus is on the cover of time, this psychedelic Jesus and this article entitled The Jesus Revolution. Who are you writing this for? Is this like a book or newspaper? A magazine. So I did a lot of research preparing for Jesus Revolution. Not only did I look at the Time Magazine article, uh, I looked at YouTube footage of Lonnie Frisbee and Catherine Kuhlman and Chuck Smith and the early days of Greg Laurie. I really wanted to understand much more about the culture, uh, the points of view of different people. So Josiah works for Time Magazine and not only does he document what happens, he himself starts to think that Maybe this wasn't just for him writing the article, there was something here for him too. Like finding just a diamond in the rough, I found an original version of this magazine on eBay and I bought it and I read this 10 page article of everything we need today. And I was motivated by it, I was moved by it. I felt like I discovered something. My generation has never experienced anything like this and I want to experience it. So it just began a seven-year obsession with revival, with the Jesus movement, and with this desire to utilize my gifts and the gifts of our team to, to tell the story. When John sent me the script to see if I was interested in directing, I, I loved it. It was powerful. It's a call back to love and compassion, empathy, seeing the other and loving them. You know, I remember talking to people that lived in the Jesus movement, and I just said, how much did this spiritual awakening and revival, how much did desperation have to do with it? And they said it was everything, it was just a desperate time. And if you look at the times we're living in now, so many of the same questions, and all the things that the characters are wrestling with are incredibly relevant to the world that we're living in today. Everything's about to change, folks whether you're ready for it or not. Other stories of the 60s have been told, but never this story. This is a significant story that in many ways changed the world. 
We were doing the film Woodlawn. We didn't have the audio of 40,000 people saying the Lord's Prayer. Greg Laurie's Harvest SoCal was coming, and I literally met him a week before that event and said, I'm John, I'm a filmmaker, I need you <laughs> to lead Angel Stadium in the Lord's Prayer. And that was where we met, so we just jumped right in. Here's all the kids sitting on the lawn of my high school, Harbor High School in Southern California, Newport Beach. I'm in Alabama, but this is so close to the way my high school actually looked. He said, you know, he's a teenage kid that got swept up into a revival. He didn't even know it was a revival. But we bonded over the idea of let's tell this story together. And the idea was how can I use my skills as a filmmaker and his skills as a pastor and as an evangelist, and how can we tell this story? There's a stewardship because someone's giving you their story to tell, and then you're having to make a movie out of it, and you're having to tell a story in 90 minutes or two hours is difficult. For me, it's so important to have that person or those people as collaborators in the process of let's do this together. And so having Greg and Kathy on set is essential. His wife, Kathy, they will be celebrating 49 years. He's how I discovered this story. He was in this tent when it happened. So I'm played by a very talented young man, Joel Courtney. Films kind of tend to take a life of their own. Once you cast them and you see the characters kind of come to life and they bring the dialogue to life. It all started with the character of Greg and Joel Courtney was the first person cast before this movie was ever even greenlit. There was nobody else because he has the heart and soul of who Greg is and was as a teenager. Is that what this is to you, family? I don't know, I don't. I don't really know what a family feels like. Greg Laurie, at the time, is very much a lost soul. He's looking for a deeper meaning to life, and he finds it in all the wrong places and in one right place. To prepare for the role of Greg, specifically from his spiritual side, I went and watched a, like, a lot of his sermons. I wanted to see him like embody the pulpit and like just watch how he connects with people. Everyone leaves eventually. Getting to play Greg has been such an honor, especially because of his relationship with Kathy. Wow, you are a rapid work in progress. It starts out in like wayward ways, looking for, you know, fulfillment in all the wrong places. And the relationship changes. Greg starts going to church and he's kind of introduced to God and discovers like there's a fulfilling life here. You got your Bibles, everybody? But it doesn't quite seem full without Kathy. And it's a beautiful relationship. Greg and Kathy were both there in real life on set with us and just getting to see like, how they talk with each other and how they banter and how they joke. And we could ask them like, what was your favorite song in like 69? You know, and what were you listening to? I would have full conversations with him and just kind of get like inspiration from him. And it's a beautiful experience of like real life meeting art. Thank you so much. Okay, I think I gotta run and, and be there for okay. you. Okay. So nice to meet you. Hey, Anna, we'll see you soon. Okay. I'm Anna Grace Barlow and I play Kathy in Jesus Revolution. And we say we're looking for truth. What if this is true? In April 2020, like very fresh pandemic time, I got an audition for Jesus Revolution to play Jeanette, who's Kelsey's character's daughter, and really loved the script. And then I wound up doing a show for Fox, and the whole time I just like kept asking about it. I'm like, it hasn't been made yet, it hasn't been made yet. Like, we don't think you got it. Like, they never said anything. And then I get an audition in fall of 2021, for Kathy, and I was like, this came back around. I'm so happy right now. You can do whatever you want. You know that, right? Maybe you can't, actually. Soldier. She's unapologetic in how she feels and she fights for things. And I saw myself and how the character was written and I, I really, really wanted to play her. <sighs> this is great. <laughs> Working with Anna Grace Barlow was awesome. She is like a light on set, you know? She just really brings this joy and wit to Kathy. It was perfect. We did a chemistry read together before she was cast, and I was already set as Greg, and I remember talking with Brent, our director, afterwards, 
I was like, yeah, yeah, it's Anna Grace. She just knocked it out of the park. When I was preparing, I got to talk to Kathy on the phone, and Greg just so happened to be at home at the time, and so they put me on speakerphone, and they were texting me like wedding photos. It was incredible. And kind of talking about their relationship. They had this kind of will they, won't they, and such a fun, playful, sort of childlike, innocent sort of love. And the fact that they have been able to make that extend like a lifetime is incredible. And so their love stories are inspiring to me because they have really worked and fought for their life together. And I love how that's depicted in the script as well. Anna Grace is one of the sweetest people that I've ever met in my life. To me, she truly embodies the spirit of Kathy Laurie. This is uh, Jonathan Rumi, who you probably know, plays Jesus and The Chosen. And uh, he's playing the role of evangelist Lonnie Frisbee who was actually speaking on the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. You have to decide for yourself. We all have to decide. My name is Jonathan Rumi. I'm playing Lonnie Frisbee, the legendary enigmatic hippie street preacher who preached in Southern California in Costa Mesa at Calvary Chapel Church alongside uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, the head of Calvary Chapel Church. When John Irwin and I saw The Chosen, you know, we're just like, the performance that he's giving is incredible. His preparation each day was to literally play Lonnie's audio tapes over and over and over again so that he can get Lonnie's cadence down. Very important for him that he just nails the essence of who Lonnie really was. Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross. It's an amazingly well-written screenplay. You rarely read scripts that speak to you on so many different levels. There's comedy, there's drama, there's tenderness, there's complexity um, with all of the characters, especially with Lonnie Frisbee. Lonnie Frisbee was a very, very complex human. It was just so beautiful to see like the, this opportunity to play somebody that had these, these human weaknesses and flaws, but who was so profoundly gifted in the spirit and in being able to heal people and inspire people just by speaking his heart to them. I can borrow from, you know, the emotional resonance of my own imperfections, of my own weaknesses, of my own personal history. and, and use that as, you know, creative thrust to bring Lonnie to life on the screen. Working with Jonathan Rumi was such an incredible time. Collaboration and working with people and just getting to have really great conversation is just kind of at the heart of what he does. And I will always be honored that I got to work with him. And you can't control the Holy Spirit, man. We can control our ministry and we must. My name's Kelsey Grammer and I'm playing Chuck Smith. Working with Kelsey Grammer is very exciting and humbling at the same time. He is such a legend. You use the spirit as an excuse to do whatever you want. The heart and just the spiritual presence that Kelsey brought forward. I mean, we would be on wide shots. He'd have his back turned and there'd be tears running down his face. I mean, he just was dialed in. Kelsey Grammer so captured Chuck Smith was, you know, when we cast him, I was like, oh, this will be interesting. I know Kelsey's a really great actor, first and foremost, but I wondered how much he'd be really into this. You always have that question with certain actors, like you don't know until you actually dive in and you get into it. And all of a sudden we started to witness Kelsey's portrayal of Chuck in some of these big uh, scenes where Chuck's preaching. It was unbelievable. Jesus made a comeback, of sorts, through the hippie movement. And it was a very rewarding time, very dynamic. And it actually continues to this day. People don't talk about it so much because I guess that's sort of fallen from grace a bit, or at least from popularity. But there are people out there who still really believe, and that's a really cool thing. This is day two with Kelsey Grammer, and he's killing it. And he's one of our great comedians in the world. But the drama that he's doing okay. is blowing us away. This is God's word. Let's open it together. Even Greg, Greg, Greg Laurie, we were watching it side by side as it was happening. He's like, this guy's incredible. I mean, he, he literally knows how to command dialogue in a way that many preachers don't. 
One of my favorite scenes in the movie is the first one where he invites the hippies into his church. And Jesus took a cup and said, this cup represents my blood, which is shed for you to take away the sins of the world. Yes, from my sins. He doesn't really know where he's going and how his church is going to fare, whether or not he's even going to remain a preacher. And then this kid walks and he thinks, I'm going to open up the church to this. And that's a pretty amazing thing. And that's exactly who Chuck Smith was, a risk taker in real life. Hence, he invited these hippies into his church, which other pastors weren't doing at that time. And, and Kelsey caught the, the goodness within that side of Chuck. And you see that kind of play out in his portrayal of Chuck. I mean, Kelsey Grammer, it's, he's a legend. Where, where do you, where, uh, I'm speechless. You know, the fact that I got to work with him was, was a highlight of my career. He's just a, a, a comic genius. Are they camping in my yard? Oh, it's okay, don't worry about them. They're used to it. When Greg and I were watching Kelsey, I asked, did Kelsey ever come up to you and ask you for pointers? And Greg said, oh, did he ever? I mean, he literally wanted to know everything from how certain uh, Christian lingo was to how Chuck might have used his hands to what his cadence was and how he was as a person, because obviously Greg knew him quite well. It's pretty neat to have Greg Laurie walk up to you and start telling you what Chuck was about. Uh, but what's been fun here is that there's so many extras, this at least today, while we're shooting this, that knew Chuck themselves, were baptized by him, you know, uh, attended his church. Then, what Greg said that I thought was pretty relevant was he said, you know, we were all kind of searching for a good dad. And uh, Chuck gave him that. I love you just the way you are. I don't want you to end up like me, Greg. I play Charlene Laurie. I'm Greg Laurie's mom. She was an alcoholic. She had seven husbands, I believe, and, and many others. Uh, Greg himself was an accident, and she didn't even know who his father was. So uh, he really had a difficult upbringing. But once he became a Christian and started preaching and found the whole Jesus movement, it really changed his whole life. Working with Kimberly was amazing. She and I were just totally in sync. Just wonderful, nuanced performance of uh, Greg's mom and the hardships that women went through back in that time period. She's just beautiful, beautiful performance in this film. Well, I'm a mom, so I always relate to that part of a character. I believe Charlene probably wanted to be a good mom at some point, even though she made a lot of poor choices. She was human and wanted to be glamorous and wanted to be so many things. And she fell short in so many ways. You know, honestly, making this film has made me look a little bit differently at my mother. You know, having lived it, I, I didn't understand why she put me through all of that. I did live for a time with my grandparents. I did go to military school for a time as she was living her crazy life. And I really just wanted to be with her. And, and I just saw her as very selfish and, and I didn't understand why. But as I've seen these scenes from the film, I, I see her more sympathetically. Also, I've had more time to think about it. And I realized she was just a broken person who was finding her own way. You said he'd be home soon, Mom. I loved watching the scenes from Greg's childhood because I knew that aspect of his life, of the brokenness of his family and all that he went through. It was really, um, I don't know, I just saw him through these actors portraying the sadness. And I appreciated that more than I, than I thought I would. Hey, Mark. First shot of the movie. Every time I work on a new project, I feel like I learn something new about myself. I've never worked with two directors before, Brent and John directing together. It's so cool. They absolutely complement each other. John is very comfortable with technology and cameras. Great shot. And Brent is very adept at the empathic nature needed from directors. You guys are killing it. You got hilarious. So it felt very balanced. 
John likes to have flexibility in a big sandbox and to be able to create something and change things on the fly. And sometimes that can be a little bit challenging and difficult, especially when you have a big crew this size. It takes a beat and a moment to be able to change your mind or make decisions that aren't exactly what you think you're gonna make. But sometimes in the moment, the camera is like an extension of his shoulder and he'll see things that he didn't necessarily see writing the script, and he wants the flexibility to be able to change that. Can you reset this whole thing? And Brent McCorkle, what a gifted guy, this guy, he's like a Swiss army knife. My uh, introduction to him was on I Can Only Imagine. He came on and he was uh, our editor. He was our composer. I've never worked with him as a director before, but I knew he was multi-talented. And so John was like, hey, I think Brent's got the vibe for what Jesus Revolution is. He'll bring that creativity to it and compliment me in a way that's uh, really great for the story. So here's the beginning of the take. Ready and action. It was an exciting opportunity to work with John. There's always that fear of, you know, are you going to get along and are you going to see things the same way? And, you know, luckily we just vibed and I mean, I'm just so happy to see what we actually achieved out there together with this amazing cast, this amazing crew. It was the greatest crew and greatest cast experience I've ever had in my career. Everybody was there to work and it got really hard. There was tears on set, mine included, <laughs> but there was also a lot of laughter. <laughs> Amidst all the tears and the laughter and the hard work, I think we made something really special. Filming The Jesus Revolution was magical. I've had more fun making the movie uh, than I have in so long. The most important to me was we go back to the actual Pirate's Cove and film the baptisms there. And as a film producer, that is not a logical decision. Pirate's Cove is a crater. You can't get to it. You have to hike over it. The surface of the rocks is like the surface of Mars. I mean, it's sharp rocks and sort of dangerous. It's not the safest location. Uh, it's not the easiest location, but it's the real location. My favorite in the movie was when Lonnie baptizes Greg, the prayer that they pray and the way that it happens. Greg actually wrote that. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Like that wasn't in the script. It was just sort of the saying this happened. I ask you to come into my life. I repent from my sins. And I repent from all my sins. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior, my God and friend. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior, my God and my friend. There's just a level of authenticity and accuracy and heart uh, that he added because he's been a pastor for over 40 years. And uh, spirituality was in the air when we were filming at Pirate's Cove and random extras were making real, you know, professions of faith in a way that I've never really been a part of in my entire career. How many baptisms a week? We're doing hundreds a week, sometimes even close to a thousand. It's, it's remarkable. The Lord is doing some amazing work here. I think the big scene really for me that I lived in real life was the baptism scene that will be shot at Pirate's Cove where thousands of kids like myself showed up to be baptized. I showed up in my 501 jeans and I didn't bring a towel and I didn't bring a change of clothes. I'd been baptized as an infant, but I had no recollection obviously of that moment. So this almost this born again experience is acted out in water. And I remember coming out shivering and coming home that night to my parents' house, dripping wet with sand in my jeans and just going, you won't believe what I did. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I am very much in favor of a future together. Yeah, and uh, thank you. There's an emotional climax in the movie where Kathy and Greg are having one of their friction moments, and it was my first night of filming that we did that. Joel and I had rehearsed together a little bit, so we did know each other, but to do that scene so early on, to kind of get it out of the way was really nice. I love you, and I want to be with you. I don't think that you really know what you want. Maybe you're the one who doesn't know what you want. Well, obviously, Kath, look at us. Yeah, look at us. We're, we're arguing, we're, we're, we're talking about our feelings, we're, we're, we're working through things. It's, it's called being in a relationship, idiot. I'm really looking forward to seeing that because 
I love acting with Joel so much. Don't tell me some that. For the look of the movie, I mean, I get involved in the beginning as far as the locations and where we shoot it, because a lot of that is budgetary issues. And so the first iteration of this, we were going to shoot it all in Southern California, which would have been really challenging. Uh, it's just so expensive to shoot here. So we looked at Alabama uh, for a big chunk of it because we shot I Still Believe there, and it was really kind of a good uh, example of being able to double California. But we always knew we needed some time here in Southern California and Orange County, especially at Pirate's Cove, because it's really a character that adds more production value to the film for us to be able to sprinkle it in and edit it in together and make it look really great. And I'm really happy with the locations that we chose in Southern California because they're really epic. I mean, they're incredible. One of the things I fight for in all my movies is trying to get maximum collaboration with the director of photography and the production designer. And when those two can come together, it's a force to be reckoned with. And we had that in our movie. We had Akis, who is our amazing director of photography, and we had Amy Holmberg, who's our production designer. And the two of them worked really well, and they ended up just making magic together. So you have these incredibly beautiful scenes, beautiful sets and so elaborate, so much thought going into them. The amount of scenic work that went into this and the patine work where you age everything down, you know, even some of the details, like there was nicotine stains on the walls in Charlene's apartment, you know, where she's a chain smoker and they actually patined nicotine on the walls just to make it feel like this dirty tenement apartment, you know, so that level of detail. And in the midst of all that, what gets overlooked at times is wardrobe, costume, hair, makeup. I loved playing this character of Charlene. First of all, I have to hand it to my hair team who created this phenomenal wig, just brought Charlene to life with this hair, and then the makeup team was phenomenal. Just like researching the makeup from the period and just making slight little tweaks. And then the wardrobe team, you know, really getting these incredible costumes. So many of them are vintage. Race through the water. That really, really helped me to have Kim disappear and Charlene emerge. Great cut right there. Let's keep that mag. <laughs> this is a house of worship. And yes, we expect a certain level of dignity here. These girls are wearing halter tops and half of them aren't even wearing shoes. They're staining the new shag carpet with their bare feet. One of the things that I really wanted to do, and Amy and I talked a about a lot, and so did Brent, is creating that world that felt very authentic, that felt very natural, and wasn't something that was gonna take you outside of the story, but it was gonna actually invite you into it. So the colors are very warm and inviting. The tone of the lighting and everything just felt very glowy. Anna Redmond's incredible. She picked vintage pieces and like modern pieces that look vintage and then custom pieces that look vintage. And she worked with a seamstress named Sophie, who was unbelievable as well. And they just had endless cute stuff. What is going on? And I feel like I'm not Kathy, but Kathy's like accessories, like what I feel like I put on my rings and like I have my hair done. I feel like Kathy. And so the, the costumes and wardrobe and the, all that stuff really helps you feel like you are the character. There was so much available to me to research. I love using real historical images to inspire me. I love real stories. So I really relied heavily on Greg. Hey, Square. I am not a square. Sorry, sorry, you dress like one. So one of the fun things that we got to do for Greg was take him from a square to like a hippie. But then there's a fun also a little bit of transition where he comes out of his military school and then he goes into public school. And he's trying to like fit in, but he's trying just a little too hard. He dresses outlandishly. And then he kind of like, we got to tone it down and bring it in a little bit. Is that your car? It's a piece of junk. It's amazing. Greg actually gave us a lot of input on like what I was wearing. He's like, this is great. And like, this is awesome. I love this. I had a jacket just like this. So it's pretty cool. Josiah, reporter. Greg. I did have some conversations with the filmmakers about my look. I actually was exchanging photos and sent a few photos of, of who I thought 
uh, we should try to model the look after. I looked up some black male journalists from back in the early 70s, late 60s, that I think Josiah could look like. Remember, he's from New York, so he's gonna bring that sophistication, you know, definitely put together, but he's on a mission. The level of detail and the level of creativity was amazing. And they hand created all of these original costumes from scratch using vintage found materials that were so interesting and so unique. And so some of your favorite outfits that you see in our movie is probably made from curtains. <laughs> and I'm not joking. You change into the right side. On this one, of course, Brent's one of the editors. He's composing the music and he's also the co-director. And I mean, he's just really a talented guy and I've, I've enjoyed working with him tremendously. There's a saying that I've rewritten for myself in film, but the saying in the movies is you get to make your movie three times, once in the writing, once when you shoot it, and once when you edit it. I actually disagree with that. I think it's four times. It's when you write it, when you shoot it, when you edit it, and when you score it. When you score over a movie, you're there to support the scene, not take it over. You're there to make people feel what they're meant to feel. You just want it to be this seamless, process that just pulls you into the story and holds you there. So I think music is one of the greatest places to do that. It's its own thing, and if you nail it, you elevate it. And that's film scoring for me. So many voices. It's hard to hear the truth. Truth is always quiet. It's the lies that are loud. The truth is simple. You know, I think the struggle that these characters go through and the journey that they go through is universal in its storytelling. I compare it a lot to, we did early on, kind of to the movie Almost Famous, kind of like an inside peek at what it was like to live during this time period. And uh, we just get to experience these particular stories as they were often told, but you actually are feeling like you're in the moment and in the movement. After they've had a great entertaining two hours in a movie theater, I think people will say, okay, this, this should happen again. And uh, that's, that's the hope of this movie. So I would say it stands out and is unique in our body of work, but we're just privileged to tell stories and we're able to make these films with more and more resources, more movie stars, more resources to promote them because our voice is getting louder and louder as an audience. I just think getting back to these themes of love, acceptance, forgiveness, belonging, compassion, empathy, I think that's what our world needs. And I think uh, once you cast aside the idea that you need to believe in something other than God, uh, God becomes a pretty good option. <laughs> it's a really compelling journey of someone with a really broken life and a broken heart finding faith, finding love. I want to go to that little Greg. I want to say, Greg, it's going to be okay, buddy. You're going to get through this. Life is going to get a whole lot better. story of finding yourself, finding your way, finding faith. I just think it's going to be so uplifting. There's comedy, there's tenderness, there's complexity with all of the characters. The production value is incredible. It feels like we've just been dropped into a moment in history. Audiences are going to get a strong message of love and hope. I hope people feel tearful and joyful all at the same time and maybe inspired to rediscover their own faith. It's been seven years to the screen for this movie and every other movie that we've made along the way, Woodlawn, I can only imagine, I still believe, American Underdog, it's all been leading to this. I remember discovering the Jesus Revolution Time Magazine cover story, and it was like unearthing this gem, and that led to this whole exploration I want to meet people that lived this. Come to find out Greg was a teenager, as was his wife Kathy, at the very origin of the Jesus Movement in Southern California. The Jesus Movement was an awakening. Not only was it the last great American awakening, I think it may have been the most significant of all. It was this beautiful fusion of Greg's coming of age story, this hippie street preacher, Lonnie Frisbee, and a down and out pastor who's pretty much lost everything. And to see him open up his doors to these hippies, that completely changed everything. I think so many of us that were drawn into the hippie movement really were searching for something more. Greg Laurie at the time is colossal. 
He's looking for truth, and he finds it in all the wrong places and in one right place. Have you decided? Uh, um, I, uh, I don't know. You want to decide right now? Yeah. One of the things that excited me most about the script was the theme. The theme is loving the other. I think that's what our world needs. I think our world really needs to heal. I think it'll challenge people's notions of the need to be perfect to be a Christian. I want audiences to be encouraged. If they leave the theater feeling encouraged and inspired, then we've done our job. Our country and the world is prime for another revival. I am praying that this movie will bring hope to a generation. I think you're going to see something on the screen you've not seen before. This story changed our nation and in many ways changed the world. You feel swept up into this movement. If a Jesus revolution happened before, it can happen again. Why can't the next Jesus revolution begin right now? Know that if God can heal me, he can heal anyone. If you look a little deeper, if you look with love, you'll see an entire generation searching for all the right things, just in all the wrong places. We can only walk through doors open to us. In your church, that's a door that's shut. So I ask you, Pastor, what would it take for you to be desperate? Seems the movement's everywhere. It's spreading like wildfire. Let's see what God has in mind. I think so many of us that were drawn into the hippie movement had sort of the same desires, the search for real meaning and purpose, and there had to be something more out there than what we saw. They were looking for all the right things. They were looking for peace and love and community and God. They were just looking in the wrong places. The Jesus movement changed our nation and in many ways changed the world. And you see like what a beautiful season in time occurred by letting this disenfranchised group of people that really didn't belong in modern church come through the doors anyway. There was a lot of love. A lot I of mean, love. I mean a lot of love. There was older people that would come up and pray for us and hug us. And, and we had a couple school teachers that basically remodeled their garage and had us come and live with them for free. Everybody was welcome. Didn't matter your religious background, didn't matter if you were on drugs, didn't matter where you were from. You were welcome, why? Because God is love. Basically all the leadership in Christianity today <laughs> came from this movement. And they were kids and they were hippies and they were swept up into a movement that actually became what many call the largest spiritual awakening in American history. We found what it was that we were looking for. And it wasn't a what, it was a who. Quite frankly, the late 60s is probably the lowest point in American history. People literally thought the world was gonna end. And so to see this beautiful revival of love and belonging and compassion emerge from all of that, it gives me hope that that could happen again. Time Magazine in 1971 did a cover story called The Jesus Revolution that is iconic, historic, and it documents the entire movement from all across the country. I remember working on the film Woodlawn, discovering this Time Magazine, and as I started learning about the Jesus Movement, I started studying the origin in Southern California. And this incredible moment where this very square pastor, Chuck Smith, portrayed by Kelsey Grammer in the film, opened his doors to what he did not understand. Like, he opened his doors to the hippies. And at the time, you did not do that. Like, a hippie could only come to church if they, like, went home, got a job, cut their hair, took a bath, now maybe they can come to church. Chuck Smith, because he had been introduced to Lonnie Frisbee, this hippie preacher, just did sort of the unthinkable at the time. He just opened his doors. And it was like nitro meeting glycerin. Lonnie was sort of like the magnet that drew young people in. And Chuck was a stabilizer that kept people in. You know, we came for Lonnie, we stayed for Chuck. If there had not been a Chuck, I'm not sure what this would have turned into, but it would not have had the legs, stability, and legacy that it has today. But if only Chuck had done it, I don't know that it would have connected to the young people. 
We lived on the top of 8th Street in South Laguna. And I remember standing in the kitchen saying, how do we tell our generation that Jesus is the answer when nobody's expecting to find the answer in church in the subculture at that time? I mean, it was, you know, very divided. People weren't really looking to churches for answers. And we knew we had to make a record. So we're standing there and we go like, I wonder if that preacher down to Calvary Chapel let us sing some of these songs. And that turned into a historic meeting where we met Chuck Smith, played him for him, and he said, can you come tonight and play? I don't ever credit us with that, but that's when the church grew from about 200 to 2,000 in about four months' time. We had to put up the circus tent that's in the movie. That's and, and that's how we got to the ocean water baptisms, because they didn't even have a baptism. It was a, a little teeny church that hold about 220 people, and so many kids were getting saved, and Chuck had a surfing background. He was like, well, the beach is right there. We'll just baptize into the beach. Big scene, really, for me, that I lived in real life was the baptism scene at Pirate's Cove, where thousands of kids like myself showed up to be baptized. Pastor Chuck would come out and speak to the group of people before they would walk over some rocks into this cove to the baptism at sunset. And I didn't bring a towel, and I didn't bring a change of clothes. And then they said, if you want to get baptized, and you know, I was like, okay, I want to do that. And so <laughs> there we go get baptized. And I remember coming out shivering and coming home that night to my parents' house, dripping wet with sand in my jeans and just going, you won't believe what I did. <laughs> my parents were a little kind of like, what in the world is happening to our daughters now? <laughs> the Jesus movement was an awakening. There was an openness to the working of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God was the centerpiece of every one of our services. There was a sense of anticipation, and I don't know that we can create that, but we would go and take our seat, and we're sitting in church waiting for things to start. It was almost like there was an electricity in the air, like what, what's gonna happen tonight? What is the Lord going to do? I think all of these things sort of combined together created this revival-like atmosphere. I think when I look at the world in our current time, the world needs this movie right now. We cannot get back to a revival in this country until you actually get back to the love of God and the words of Jesus. Christ is still the answer. The only answer is gonna change the problems of the world. I think we have to be open today that God might use people that we don't think he would use. And I'm hoping that this film will inspire people to pray, Lord, do it again. There's never been a time of desperation in my life like it is right now. And it's so similar to this same time when God showed up. If a Jesus revolution happened before, it can happen again. And it begins with an individual saying yes to Jesus. I'm John Irwin. Welcome to the early access premiere of Jesus Revolution. You're seeing the film early with bonus content a day before the rest of the world sees it tomorrow. We're here on the set of the Living Water music video shoot and song that she wrote for this film. We're so glad you're here. We have some great content for you. We wanna talk about the behind the scenes of the film and then you're gonna see the film first. So here we go. Guys, introduce yourself. I'm Brent McCorkle. I was co-director with John and also the composer on the film. I am Ann Wilson and I'm so honored to have an original song called Living Water on this film. I'm Kevin Downs, I'm the producer of Jesus Revolution, and we're excited that you're able to see this movie tonight. We're on the set of Living Water, and talk about your inspiration for writing this song. What's it like to write a song? What do you think when yeah. you saw the film? Talk us through that process. I was blown away when I saw the film. I think it really helped me kind of take a fresh look at my faith for the first time in a long time. I really kept kind of hearing throughout the film the title Living Water and the concept of the importance of being baptized and coming up and having this life. And I wrote this with a couple of my good friends, Matthew West and Jeff Pardo. We got to the heart of it, which is knowing Jesus, sharing him with others, but also experiencing that fresh passion for him. How long does it take to write a song? Like, what's the... It's, it honestly depends on the day. Uh, for us, we wrote this song in about two hours. What? Which is fast um, because of the inspiration that we got from this film. Like, it, it sparked so much in us that we had pages of notes that we were taking as we were watching the movie. We actually could have probably written like five or six songs out of it. Oh, this is your invitation. Oh, no more. 
One thing I love about your song that blows me away, and I sing it, I sing it all the time. I love it so much. But, sing um, it right now. Uh, I'm I'll kidding. sing with her. She's singing with her. I'm, I'm being intimidated, man. But it's so invitational. It's like an invite. Like, come come be a part of this thing. Like, can you talk about just the invitational nature of it? Because yeah. I think sometimes people outside the church or outside organized religion, they don't feel invited in. Yeah. And that's kind of what our movie is about. So I just yes. wondered, yep. talk to me about just the invitation. You know, I, I grew up in a, a Christian home. My parents raised me in church, and it was great, but I, I felt the same way. I didn't know Jesus, and I didn't feel invited and welcomed in. I felt very much like he was just this God that, like, judged down on the earth. So when I met Jesus, that was the starting point for me, was realizing that I can have a personal relationship with him. It's like an invitation. Like, he's like, come to me. Like, come to me. I want to be your father. I want to love you. And that's really what this song is about, just an invitation to the people that don't know him, like this is an invitation to come and to experience something that's fresh and real and tangible and raw. Come down to the living water and rise up new. Did you have a favorite part of the movie that you liked? Oh, it was honestly all so good. But um, I think just the whole baptism scene, like over and over again, people being baptized, it gave me as an artist and as a, an influencer or a leader, it gave me a fresh vision for what I really want for my future to know that I'm writing songs that are impacting people enough to where they want to accept Jesus and then go be baptized and have a relationship with him. And again, that was where the living water thing came from. It was just such a fresh vision for that. The baptism day. Yeah. Um, that was quite the day. It was, it was a production nightmare. And it, it really was, was. The historical events took place at Pirate's Cove and John was, um, really wanting us to do it there. There was talks about moving in other places and we ended up getting to shoot at the real Pirate's Cove. And I think there was something really magical about going back to the place on the earth where these things really happened in 1969, 1970. What's wonderful when you make movies, and I, I have to think when you're, you're making music, when you hit that moment when you know God is present in this moment, mm. And that happened on the set of this film. A couple of our actors are out in the water and we're doing, you know, five minute takes of just baptisms. And all of a sudden, uh, both of them come kind of running up with big smiles on their faces. And they're like, you'll never believe what happened. Like, I just baptized five people while we were rolling for real, real. Yeah. like for real. Like, and it was just like, what? And it, it was amazing to watch and to witness. Real Greg, uh, Laurie, uh, baptized one of the actors and just, just God was just present in that moment. And it's, it's reassuring, it's refreshing to know when that takes place. I would say that day filming at Pirate's Cove was the most spiritually profound day. You could just feel God's presence. And I hope you feel that profoundness when you see the film. The emotion that you're feeling when you see it was the same emotion we all felt while we were filming it, and that's why I think it was so important to go back to exactly where it actually happened. It's pretty cool. I think a lot of kids are turned off to even going to church is because mm -hmm. this hatred is kind of getting co-opted into everything in our society. And I just mm -hmm. wonder, like, do you have any thoughts on just the love of God? Or I tried to put as much love into this movie as I could because I really yeah. feel like that's that's what we need right now. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think in my generation, there's so much brokenness in kids. And I think as I've kind of grown up a little bit, and especially as I've been a writer and an artist, I've realized the importance in sharing love and sharing just stories and, and being real with people. And that's something that I think my generation longs for is realness and vulnerability and just being yourself. But I think so much of the church sometimes can feel like a closed door. And I've been just reminded, just especially after watching this film, of the importance in loving people the way that Jesus did. Um, loving people with just grace and forgiveness. And that's shown over and over and over again in this film. I'm a Christian, but it ignited my faith again. It was almost like a fresh restart. And I think it's going to do that for other people, too. When we made the film, your song, My Jesus, was on every station, mm. it seemed like. It was like, okay, that's... A natural fit. We should have her watch the movie. That's really sweet. And so the fact that you really resonated with it, just yeah. feel like God put that on our heart and, and wow. just thank you for yes. your ministry and what you're doing yeah. at your age and it's inspiring people because it's not mm. easy. Mm. Um, but, but thank you for what you do. John, why don't you talk, uh, talk to us a little bit about how you came across the magazine, how that happened. We were doing a movie called Woodlawn 
uh, all of us together. And I was so blown away by the power of that story that I was like, could this have really happened? Could a whole high school have been saved? And so I, I began to study the time. And I and I, I discovered this thing called the Jesus Movement. And I found this magazine. It's, the, it's Time Magazine, uh, 1971. And Jesus was on the cover. It's like a 10-page spread on this revival that was sweeping America. And I just got so curious because I grew up in the church and was baptized when I was five. And but I've never experienced this. And come to find out, like, my parents were saved in the Jesus movement. Nobody really studied how it swept America at a very similar time. It was very, very similar to today. And there was a cultural desperation. There was a counterculture movement. And I just read this article and, like, wept. Like, I want to experience that. I want to experience it in my life, in my family, in our time. And could this happen again, you know? And and I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, because we are old, but I feel, I feel like um, what's interesting is, yes, there's people leaving the church and organized religion. I feel like that there is a spiritual hunger, like a spirituality in your generation, which was similar to the time. Is that accurate? Absolutely. There's a longing for just answers for someone to love them. And in my generation, I feel like they're longing for Jesus and they just don't realize it. I did a lot of research for the Jesus Revolution. I looked at Lonnie Frisbee and Catherine Kuhlman and Chuck Smith and the early days of Greg Laurie. I also looked at what was going on in the civil rights movement at the time. I was really trying to bring all of that history with me. The late 60s is probably the lowest point in American history. And all of these things were converging into a very, very negative take on where America was headed. We really were searching for a better way to live, a more purposeful life. It was 1970 and people who looked like us with long beards and coming out of the drug culture, it just really scared church people. You have these groups of people that are totally different. Groups that would never hang out together, all being a part of a movement and learning that they could love each other. The Jesus movement really has involved different voices and they really wove together to make a powerful movement. I think they just were hearing from the Spirit and walking together. Watching this film being made, I feel like my life has flashed before me. You get really invested in the period and the time and these characters and their relationships, audiences are gonna get a strong message of love and hope. Each face, each role, it's a bunch of people that just joined the movement. And it ended up being a hippie commune that I wanted to live in and a, and a, and a church that I wanted to be a part of and baptisms that I, I just wanted to be a part of it. Greg and Kathy Laurie were teenagers that were saved in the Jesus Movement. And the love story between the two of them binds the film together. John Irwin, along with Brent McCorkle, are telling a big story. So they decided to tell it through the lens of Kathy and I, as we came to Christ during the Jesus Movement, how we met each other. So it's a love story. I love Kathy's strong personality. She's unapologetic in how she feels and she fights for things. I saw myself and how the character was written. I heard the gospel from some young people. They looked like hippies. And they said, well, we found what it was that we were looking for. And it wasn't a what, it was a who. I was very attracted in the script to a message of hope that the film brings. It's heartbreaking, it's powerful, these are real people's stories and I very much got connected to the redemptiveness of it. When I was preparing to come out and film, I got to talk to Kathy on the phone. Greg just so happened to be at home, so they put me on speakerphone. They have really worked and fought for their life together, and they're amazing people who chose each other. Because I got really big plans, Kathy, and I want to do it with you. I always come to Kathy first. She's my first line of defense, my first counselor, my first sounding board. God has held us, and he has taken us through many storms. Life isn't easy, but God is good. We just don't want this to end. It's not going anywhere, and neither am I. 
My name's Kelsey Grammer. I'm playing Chuck Smith in Jesus Revolution. He's a, a man sort of at a loss. He doesn't really know where he's going and how his church is going to fare, whether or not he's even going to remain a preacher. And then this opportunity presents itself to him. This kid walks and he thinks, I'm going to open up the church to this. And it's a pretty amazing thing. My stars. Hi, Chuck Smith. Who are you? My name is Jonathan Rumi. I'm playing Lonnie Frisbee, the hippie street preacher who preached alongside Pastor Chuck Smith. I've never read a script that had a character that was like this. It was just so beautiful to play somebody that had these human weaknesses and flaws, but who was so profoundly gifted in being able to inspire people just by speaking his heart to them. I spent a real long time in the gutter with my own addictions, and I'm God to heal me. He can heal anyone. God can use anybody he wants, no matter how fractured or broken or flawed, and create miracles from the most unexpected sources. You don't have to be perfect to introduce people to Jesus. To see these flawed human beings finding a way to love each other and create this community, I think that's what our world needs. I think our world really needs to heal. and like get back to the tenant of the thing, which is love. I wanted to do something that meant something. I was almost in a, a minor despair about doing something of value. Does it matter? And then this script was delivered to me the next day. Okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> If you look with love, you'll see a bunch of kids that are searching for all the right things, just in all the wrong places. What would it take for you, Chuck Smith, to be desperate? I think it'll challenge people's notions of the need to be perfect to be a Christian. I hope people feel tearful and joyful all at the same time, and maybe inspired to rediscover their own faith. Hey, I'm Brett McCorkle, co-director and composer for Jesus Revolution. I'm John Irwin, and I am co-director, uh, co-writer, and co-producer. What we have for you are some scenes that hit the cutting room floor because our layout was... Three hours. The first cut of the movie was three hours. We like it that way. And then it's about, okay, what hour can we lift from the movie? And you go through and there's a version like it's it's obvious what needs to come out and then that gets it down to 245 and then the last few scenes that you have to cut to get the movie really humming are truly truly painful especially when the performances are this good and so we've decided to lift those scenes from the cutting room floor and give them to you now. So we have a handful of scenes for you to enjoy they were the hardest scenes for us to let go with some commentary and without so enjoy the scenes. This is not it. Okay, they don't we are. Are we in it? Are we? We're in it. This is the director's commentary okay, to deleted scenes that we have not seen in a long time. <laughs> the first cut of this movie was three hours ish, right at three yes. hours. So we had, which is exactly what needs to happen. Then you have to decide what hour of the movie do you eliminate, and you start whittling it down. I love that, just staring at the cross. Yeah. So. We had this scene between Lonnie and Chuck where Chuck just feels really defeated and Lonnie comes up and shares this vision that he has of this place being absolutely full. Okay, send you. And uh, she told me to tell you to come home. Man, I haven't seen oh, this stuff in forever. No, it's so sweet. Um, I'm a pastor's kid. And uh, it's amazing, well, you know, like, you really do pin your entire identity here, on how successful this. your church is. Um, Sanctuary being full of people. And uh, this is real. I mean, yeah. I watched my dad struggle with this and it was heartbreaking. Um, you you pin your entire success as a human being and church your relationship with your with God people. on how good your church is doing yeah. and rightly or wrongly. But um, sometimes God but gives me a vision. The idea. Um, shows me such an innocent thing of just a guy that just wants his church to be full yeah you know which is what every pastor wants is that too much to ask he says and the idea that lonnie has these visions and he would have these visions about people that were crazy accurate um in a way that's really unexplainable uh so i love that you know um 
Well, I wish I could see that. Mm. It's a hard moment to let go. You will. Oh, man. What a good scene. It's so good. Let's re-edit the film. Let's put it in. Yeah, right. And if any man hears my voice... And lets this was a scene that did a few things. It was just... There was this whole sort of sub subplot of just the tension between Lonnie and Connie. And that he wasn't really letting her in. And the, you know... And she felt ostracized. I love this moment here where people are saying, this is just not for me. Um, they'd never let us in. It isn't for us, man. We had to lose this scene. Why not? But I love this line of the guy. He improv this line. That's not true. This isn't for some people. Another so funny good. story with Jonathan was... Um, he had prepped that entire preaching thing on the quad, and Greg. I, I heard Greg walk up to me. He goes, "Man, did you write that that oh, sermon?" And, he, and, and, and Jonathan goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Man, that was really good." Yeah. Hey, Connie. How's and he it, uh, did. How's it going up on the main stage? So just this mm. idea. He's a growing rock star. That he's a growing rock star, yeah. and she feels. He doesn't want me. You know, step by step, inched out of his, you know, you know, life, and we. Uh, we just didn't have time for that subplot. Oh, oh man. Kevin, how much does this one make you hurt? Yeah, because we dude. worked so hard to lock down this yeah. location at night, and we did. Two hundred thousand dollars later, literally, literally had <laughs> police officers looking at their watches, uh, ready to arrest ready us, ready to uh, take us away, and then this one ended up not going in the movie. Which was certainly painful. But. We tried three times to get this into the edit, just because it's so beautiful. Nobody had ever filmed, I think, on this Balboa fun zone. And we just could not make it work. Mm -hmm. But the idea that they're in it to learn together is the substance of the scene. And and there was this beautiful scene after. Did we put that in here? In the... In the maybe not. In the... Uh, deleted scenes where she went home and uh, and tells her parents that she was actually just studying the Bible which just blows them yeah. away no we got it um, and uh, and but yeah sorry Kevin mm -hmm. all the work you just never know yeah. what you're gonna use and what you're not gonna use I yeah. wish there was a way that would revolutionize producing yeah if we just knew the AI Mom, Dad. Kathy, who is that boy? Uh, Greg, from school. You know I'm home before curfew, right? And <clears throat> what were you doing exactly? We worry, Kathy, that's all. With good reason. Well, if you must know, we spent three hours arguing about Paul's letter to the Ephesians, so, yeah. That's what we were doing. Arguing? What? The Bible. Mom, you're reading the Bible. Oh. Well, is he Catholic? <laughs> Good night. Who are the Ephesians? Are you joking? Isn't that a band? Oh. Come and sit down, you So, this scene preceded, um... Are you kidding me? He just her showing up and the breakup with Greg. Instead, we moved the breakup after Lonnie left, and we just didn't need this, this scene anymore. But the performances were great. I love this. I love this. This is definitely based off having a daughter. It's like, she, like, comes in... At least she came back. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, Typically, respectful. You know, I mean, she came back. It's the, the performances are cool in this too. It's it was hard to see say goodbye to it. The point of this scene 
was her saying, you've never been to church, Dad. Like, I wish you would just show up. We decided to put that line in the in the scene by the pool. Whatever it is that you all do in that tent. But this is yeah. definitely what her dad felt. Yeah, that, but we had it covered, you know, in the other scene. We had enough information in the other scene to let this go. And again, you know, just, I always say. So as scripted, we moved a bunch of the scenes. I have a lot of dark analogies in filmmaking because it's a lot of it's really hard, but oftentimes I say, all right, I'm going to put a revolver in your hand and you have to pick which finger you're going to blow off. It's like, that's editorial. It's not a good choice, right? There's not a good choice in that, to... in that scenario. So all these deleted scenes is, are kind of that for me. We had three hours. We had to pick an hour. Yeah, and to this cut. shot, the way, I mean, this is such a beautiful shot too, the way we staged it where he looks out and there's, there's I mean, dude, his yeah. mom, but it just, it's painful, but it has to go. Yeah, that was cool. I yeah. love, um, you guys really deployed the Steadicam well in this. Um, so yeah, this was originally a, a much longer scene. <laughs> <laughs> As evidenced by that. Yeah. Okay, so this was originally, we had this beautiful moment where they go to the VW bus. This introduces the VW bus. I like this scene a lot where he, mm -hmm. she cuts off she his tie. And, dresses him down. Yeah. Oh, what Wait, what are you doing? Oh, you don't do? like my tie. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But... We just decided that okay. that for time we we just didn't need it, and and we sort of got all this in the next scene when they were coming back um, to the from the hangout. So this this was sort of redundant. 